Factor investing draws on historical research about the kinds of stocks which beat the broad market, in the hope that those will carry on beating the market in future. Now, you can either buy an index fund, which does this for you, or you can build your value fund or momentum fund or some combination of factors out of single stocks. And that's what we'll try to do in this video. Now, you're going to need some kind of research tool to do that. And in this video, we'll use stockcard.io, which is sponsoring this video. So let's look at how to build your own value stroke momentum fund in a bit more detail. Let's start off by looking at the factors which work best. And a great place to start is to look at this book called What Works on Wall Street by Jim O'Shaughnessy, where Jim did loads of back tests to find the strategies which had the best performance. Now, one particular combination of factors that works particularly well is to combine value and momentum. Here he calls it growth, but it is in fact momentum. But the idea here is that with momentum, the problem is that it often jigs and jags. It can be caught out by a market reversal, and it actually gets smoothed out if you combine it with value. The problem with value, on the other hand, is that it can underperform for long periods of time. So by combining it with momentum, you can ensure that that doesn't happen for too long. So that's the strategy we're going to try and implement ourselves. Now in the book, Jim describes in detail how to implement the strategy. The first point here is that it's part of the all stocks universe. So it's not small caps, mid caps or large caps. It draws from the entire US stock market, but it does have the constraint that the market cap has to be greater than $200 million. The second point is the value filter. So here you're just buying stocks which are cheap based on certain measures, which we'll describe in a sec. And then the third filter is based on momentum. And that's just looking at the price change over the last six months. Now, the definition of value can vary quite widely. So Jim is very specific about what he means. These are the six different measures which he combines to create his value score. So it's based on things like price to book, price to earnings, price to sales, and so on. Now, this exact filter is not available in the app that we're going to be looking at. So we're really just going to use this as inspiration for our filter. But if you did want to replicate Jim's strategy exactly, then you'd need a system which had specific filters for all of these criteria. And it's worth having a quick look to see exactly how well this combination worked. If we look at the single year return, you can see it beat the all stock index, which is like the whole market, in 461 out of 541 periods. That's 85% of the time. And the average annual excess return was considerable. It wasn't much less than 10%. And as we expand the period of time over which we compare the return, it actually improves the performance. So over a five year period, for example, it outperformed 100% of the time. And then the average excess return was actually a bit more than 10%. Now, this is not a strategy. In fact, no strategy will outperform all of the time. So you can see the worst performance over a one year period was a fall of about 45%. Of course, because this is a pure equity strategy. And you'd expect falls of that size if you're just allocating to equity. But what really matters is the longer periods of time. That's when factor investing really works very well. So for example, over a five year period, it never had a negative return historically. And that's for all the five year periods between 1964 and 2009. And if you look over a 10 year period, the stats look great. The worst performance was 10% per year and the best performance was 30. So I think this combination of value and momentum is a very interesting combination of factors. Now let's look at how to implement that combination of factors in practice. This is what the stock card app looks like. And what we're going to do is create a stock screen. So to do that, we go into the menus here at the top and we choose stock screener. And on the left here, you can see some screeners which I've used in the past, but we're going to create a new screen. So we'll click on this filter icon and we'll say start screening stocks. So let's give it some kind of name like value and momentum, and we'll save it. And now we can start editing that filter. So if we scroll down, you can actually see the attributes which we can use to filter our stocks. Now notice that these are quite simplified. They're quite easy to understand. So I think for people who are starting out in investment, who might find things like price to book or price to value difficult to understand, this system is very clearly explained and very clearly laid out. 
So as this is a value filter, let's start off with that criterion. So if we scroll down, we'll start to see the fundamental criteria here, and we're going to use undervalued. Now there are four levels that you can choose here, and I'm just going to choose undervalued stock. You could also choose, say, neutral, which is stocks which are not particularly expensive or cheap, but that's not what we're going to go for here. So if I click on apply now, we'll see for all of the stocks in their universe, how many stocks are left over based on that filter. And you can see that there are 5,427 of them. So now let's apply the next filter. And this one will be based on momentum. So we'll scroll down till we see the technical indicators at the bottom here. Now I could use simple moving average, but that's based on 50 and 200 day momentum, which is far too short term. Remember Jim's criterion was based on six month momentum. So we'll try and use a criterion which is longer term. And it actually turns out that the one which works quite well is past investment return. So that's here in the fundamental filter. So I'm going to choose good, outperform the market. And as we'll see in a moment, that criterion is over a longer period of time than the technical ones that you can see at the bottom. So let's apply that. And now we're down to just 58 stocks, which is much more manageable. If we want to reduce the size of our portfolio further, we could apply more criteria. And one example of that might be sales growth, which is pretty good. So if I scroll down to fundamental, I'll choose positive sales track record. Another quality criterion might be good profitability. So here we'll choose positive earnings track record. So now let's apply those two extra criteria for quality. And now we're down to 32 stocks. So if we like this filter, what we can now do is save it. And you can see that saved successfully. Now notice in the top right here, there's a share menu so that you can share this on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or via email. Or you can download the list of stocks into a spreadsheet. So if you wanted to export this into some other system, which is something I might do to backtest the strategy, then you just click on download and that writes the file into a CSV file. So I can now sort this list based on market cap and you can see the largest two stocks in it are Cisco and Goldman Sachs. And if I wanted to drill down into those, I can do that by clicking on the actions here on the right. So I can add this stock to a watch list, or I can follow the stock by clicking on the bell, or we could look at that stock in more detail now. And this is what it shows us for Cisco systems. Notice that you're not going to be blinded by lots of numbers here. It just gives you a tick or a cross or some kind of gauge which tells you where the stock lies based on that criterion. So for example, you can see investors are overexcited about the stock right now. And if you want to see what that means, you just click on the definition and you can see which of those four factors are actually showing that people are overexcited right now. It's based on money inflow, lots of people are buying the stock and it's based on very little short interest. And that means that not many people are betting on the stock price falling. Now the social aspect of the app is quite important as well. So you can see how many people have viewed this stock recently, how many people are following it, remember that bell icon, and how many people are watching it. But you can also see how many people actually own it, at least on this platform. Another useful thing is it tells you which collections include Cisco. So it falls into communication equipment because that's the service it provides, but also Metaverse, which is quite trendy at the moment. And if you're into ESG, you can see that it's got a zero waste commitment and it also has some kind of policy about offsetting its carbon footprint. Now, if you want to dig into other aspects of the stock, you can look at the company's strength, its investment return. Remember, we filtered on that, but also whether it pays a dividend, its current valuation, because this is a value stock after all. But also what's useful for people starting out is the kind of investment strategies which this stock would be appropriate for. So is it good for buy and hold strategies? Is it good for generating a dividend? Is it good for generating long-term growth? So this would only be the first stage of your research. You'd also have to check each of these numbers to ensure that the stock does exactly what you want. But fortunately, Stock Card provides you with the tools to do that and also explains how they work, which is very important, I think. So we've seen how to actually select the stocks initially, but then there's an ongoing process, which is maintenance of that portfolio. Now the filter that we created is based on data today. And it may be that some of those stock prices increase. That's what we're hoping anyway. And if that happens, then those value stocks are no longer value stocks. So that's why our portfolio is a dynamic thing. We continually have to reevaluate 
whether a stock still belongs in our portfolio. Another way in which Stock Card helps you with that is that it will email you. So here's an email I got about a filter I made previously telling me that Camtech Limited, which had a fair share price when I looked at it previously, is now overvalued. So what I could do is if I'd already implemented this portfolio and bought Camtech Limited as part of my value portfolio, I could then go and swap out Camtech for something which is now a value stock. At the very least, I might go to Stock Card's website and look at what's happening with Camtech. And I'd look at the valuation multiples to see exactly why it's fair value rather than being cheap. So for example, the price to earnings multiple is almost 28 times, and that suggests that it's quite expensive. Similarly, the price to sales ratio is also at the expensive end, which is here on the left. But it doesn't just use those criteria, it also looks at price to free cash flow, for example. And based on that criterion, it's actually still looking like fair value. And on price to book ratio, it's actually looking undervalued. So you can dig into the reasons why a particular stock has moved out of its category. And that's probably worthwhile to see if you agree that Camtech is now fair value or looking a little bit expensive. So while there is a degree of subjectivity about this, the good thing about stockcard.io is that it does have these hard thresholds for fair value and cheap. So how does a manually constructed factor portfolio compare with one off the shelf if you simply bought a value index fund? One big difference is the amount of work involved in rebalancing the portfolio. You can't be asleep at the wheel here. You can't just buy the fund and leave it. You'd have to actively monitor when stocks become expensive or when their momentum reverses. And that might be quite an additional amount of work for you as an investor. Now, some people enjoy that kind of thing. Some people don't. You've got to be honest with yourself about which of those you are. And it may be, say for example, you've just had a baby or you've just got married you've got better things to do than spend time rebalancing your portfolio. So all I'd say is be honest with yourself about how much time you can spend maintaining this portfolio. And the other big difference, I think, is that it becomes easier to shy away from the portfolio if you're maintaining it yourself. You may change the criteria which it uses to filter based on the latest whim, and that's probably not going to work well over the long term. So you've got to have endurance when it comes to maintaining these portfolios. Find a factor combination you're happy with and stick with it for a long period of time. Now there will be periods of underperformance and you're going to need real willpower to stick at it. So make sure that you've got the mental wherewithal to do that before you start. Now you're probably thinking that's a lot of work. I don't think that's something for me. The primary reason I think for doing this is about the learning. Because you're getting your hands dirty and learning about valuation, about momentum, but also about the difficulty of sticking with one of these strategies, I think you're gonna learn a lot more than you would by simply buying a fund and holding it. And you never know, you might actually enjoy the process. Because if you buy the single stocks, you're going to become part of the narrative. You'll be much more engaged with those stocks because you'll have researched them, and when things work, it feels great. So building and maintaining your factor portfolio with single stocks is a lot of work, but it may be worthwhile because you'll learn a great deal and you'll have greater engagement with the stocks in your portfolio. If you do use stockcard.io as a tool to build that portfolio, then there's a free version. And if you upgrade to VIP, you get a 10% discount as a viewer of PensionCraft. Just use PensionCraft as the promo code. That's the name of our channel. And also, there'll be a link to that in the description of this video. And as always, thank you for listening.